thank you very much for joining us. I know it's, uh, I think, 8 o'clock in the morning there uh, in San Jose, but welcome uh, to Moscow and welcome to Spaso House uh, virtually. And on back, the ambassador, who I think is probably off camera on the left hand side, you have a crowd uh, of young innovators uh, and people who have been uh, working in the field of innovation, uh, starting new enterprises, and uh, also students uh, who uh, I think are pumped up to, to hear what you have to say. Uh, and also in connection with uh, the Global Entrepreneurship Week that we uh, are celebrating here in Moscow and that the embassy is supporting. So, Dave, I'll turn it over to you, and then maybe uh, at the end we can back to questions. Great. Thank you very much. And I'd like to start off by thanking the ambassador for the opportunity to speak to you uh, this evening. And um, just some quick background on myself. Um, so my name is Dave Evans, and I actually wear two hats at Cisco. I'm the chief futurist for Cisco, and then also the chief technologist for a group called the Internet Business Solutions Group. My background is technology. I have a computer science and computer engineering background. I've been at Cisco for about 22 years, so a long time Cisco veteran. And I, I've always tried to apply technology to real business needs and real human needs. And today, what I want to talk about is a deck called the Net Effect. And ultimately, it's about, you know, Cisco talks often about what we make. What I want to talk about is what we make possible. Networking technology is fundamentally changing everything that we do. It's changing how we communicate, how we educate, how we share, how we provide transparency. Uh, it's an amazing tool in technology, and we're just beginning. Uh, by some estimates, about 1% of the things that could be connected are connected, which means that 99% of the world is still unconnected. And if you think about that, you know, your cars are not connected, many homes are not connected, many businesses are not connected from a monitoring perspective. The opportunity is phenomenal. So today I want to just spend some time talking about the role of the network and the role that the network is playing in our lives. And let me set the stage first. So we are learning at exponential rates as a society and as a species. And in fact, on average, in human knowledge today is doubling about every decade or so. In some industries, it's more mature, uh, and maybe doubling uh, perhaps less often. In, more, um, in some industries that are emerging, like biotech or nanotech, we're learning much, much faster every two to three years. But sort of the net net, if you will, is that in 50 years, 95% of everything we know as a species will be discovered in the next 50 years. That's the rate at which we are learning. Some of you may know Ray Kurzweil. Ray is a futurist, inventor, author. And he has postulated that the century that we're in now, 21st century, will be equivalent to 20,000 years of progress at today's rate of progress. We will do more in the next 100 years than we have done in all of human history combined. That's the path that we're on. Now is an amazing time to be alive. Now is an amazing time to be an innovator, to be an entrepreneur. The opportunities have never been greater. And hopefully by the time I'm done with this presentation, you'll be convinced. So let's jump into sort of the first chapter, if you will. The first thing <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about is the first evolution of the internet. And this is the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything phenomenon. The World Wide Web has obviously gone through four fairly distinct phases. We moved from academia to uh, sort of information where to the transaction web, and now we're sort of in the uh, really the fourth phase of the web. We call it sort of um, Web 2.0, but it's a social web. It's about the Twitters and the Facebooks and the Google Pluses of the world. But what about the network itself? What about the fundamental infrastructure, if you will? The network itself hasn't fundamentally changed over the last few decades. It's, it's much bigger, it's more pervasive, we've standardized on IP, but fundamentally, when you buy a network asset, a computer, a switch, a router, what have you, it lives its life in a data center uh, in your home for the duration of, of its life. That's changing. The network now is fundamentally shifting in terms of its topology, uh, how it's being used. We're now entering an era of the Internet of Everything, Internet of Things. And we've now crossed this threshold where there are more things connected to the Internet than people using it. And that has some profound implications. If we look at the, uh, the waves, if you will, of the Internet of Things, we've gone through three fairly distinct waves. Wave one was when you went to the technology, you went to your computing device. 
and you want your PC, your laptop, what have you. Wave two, which we're just about to exit, uh, and these are overlapping. Wave two is when the technology came with you, your iPad, your Android phone, uh, your iPhone, that type of thing, the mobility um, of the internet. So the internet became very, very mobile. We're now entering an era of the internet of things or internet of everything where we're adding new capabilities, we're adding sensing capabilities, we're instrumenting the world with new ways to sense what's going on. And we're moving from about 50 billion devices, sorry, about 10 billion devices today to about 50 billion devices over the next eight, nine, 10 years. So the number of things on the internet that, that sense, uh, that can video, that can instrument our world is rapidly dwarfing the number of people using the network. And 50 billion could be just the beginning. What we're seeing are things like tiny computers that are not much bigger than a millimeter in size, coupled with cameras, you can see on the slide here, we're tiny cameras, not much bigger than a hypodermic needle, and then sensors, MEM sensors, microelectromechanical sensors. So where we left off, well, we were talking about the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything. And what we're seeing is the number of things connected to the Internet balloon from about 10 billion today to 50 billion over the next you know, uh, nine, 10 years. And we're seeing many of these devices shrink to uh, very tiny uh, sizes with sensing capability, with video capability, with wireless mesh capability so they can intercommunicate amongst themselves. And we're seeing the planet rapidly being covered with wireless connectivity. Today, about 90% of the planet has broadband wireless where there are people. Within the next decade, about 100% of the planet will have wireless coverage as broadband speed in fact, early last year, the UN announced a resolution for 100 megabits uh, per second to a, hand, a handset device like a mobile phone, which means we're going to start to see rapid uh, um, speeds come to handsets, iPads, iPhones, tablets, things like that. We're also seeing devices or things that we did not expect to be connected to the Internet get connected. So by way of example, there's a tree in Brussels that has um, that is laden with sensors and cameras, and this tree tweets. This tree talks about its environmental conditions to Twitter, and this tree has 4,000 Twitter followers. There's a Dutch company called Sparked that's attaching sensors to livestock to cows, and each cow is generating 200 megabytes a year. In fact, some of these cows can actually send a text message when they are about to give birth. So we're starting to connect to things like inanimate objects, like trees and livestock and what have you, to the internet. We're also connecting medical devices in record numbers, things like asthma inhalers that can cross-reference their location uh, or cross-reference your location with weather conditions and then notify you if you need to use your inhaler. We're seeing light bulbs where each individual light bulb has a unique IP address and the bulb can change color based on conditions. So imagine a light bulb connected to the internet that perhaps turns green when your stock portfolio is going up or turns red when your stock portfolio is going down. And we're even seeing pills, tiny pills that you swallow that have uh, chips on them. And as you swallow this pill, the chip broadcasts to a plaster or Band-Aid on your stomach, which in turn broadcasts to your mobile phone to let your physician know that you've taken the pill. So the point is that we're seeing all kinds of devices that we did not expect to be connected to the internet get connected. We're also seeing vehicles connected to the internet. So today there are about a billion cars on the road. By mid-century, we expect four billion vehicles to be connected. And by about 2040, 75% of these cars will be fully autonomous. They will be autonomous because they're connected to the network, because they're, they're talking to one another and they're talking to the infrastructure. So it's very likely that the next car or the car after that that you buy will be an autonomous or semi-autonomous car. And the reason that's important is that we're moving into cities in record numbers. Within the next few decades, 75% of people will live in cities. And we're gonna see significant gridlock if we don't figure out how to uh, improve efficiency through uh, optimization of some of our infrastructure. 
And Bill Ford uh, from Ford Motor Company believes that we can boost highway capacity by almost three times by creating autonomous vehicles. So as we start to connect more and more things to the internet, there's benefits in terms of optimization. We are moving from internet uh, version 4, IPv4, to IPv6 over the coming decade. And that will allow us to move from the constraints of IPv4, which allows for about 4 billion devices to be connected, to IPv6, which allows every one of you in that room could have 52,000 trillion trillion devices each. Every atom on the surface of our planet could have 100 addresses each with IPv6. So as we move to IPv6 over the coming years, we'll have enough addresses to connect all these billions and billions of devices. So why do we care about any of this? I mean, why do we care about connecting all these things and sensing everything? Well, historically, we have sensed our world with sort of the five senses that we've been given, sight, hearing, touch, and so on. And in many ways, all of these devices that are being connected, that are sensing, act as a proxy for our own senses. And we're creating data at an unprecedented rate. And as, over the coming years, as we learn to take that data and we turn it into information and then knowledge and then wisdom, the benefit to humanity is significant. Now, all of these things that I've talked about are creating massive amounts of information. I'm sure you all feel like you get inundated with email messages every single day, and that's just the beginning. In 2008, we created five exabytes of new information. And five exabytes is not a lot, but what's significant about five exabytes is that in one year, we created more new information than we did in all of human history. And by the end of 2013, we will create five exabytes of information every 10 minutes. So by the end of 2013, we will cre create every 10 minutes what we have created in all of human history combined in terms of digital data, digital knowledge. By uh, 2012, we'll see that five exabytes jump to about one zettabyte. We'll see about a zettabyte of information flow across the network in the next couple of years. And to, to give you a sense of how much that is, because it's hard to visualize what a zettabyte is, picture the following. Picture a bookshelf from Earth to Pluto and back 20 times, about a 72 billion mile long bookshelf, that is how much data we're creating on an annualized basis. Next year, that number will double again. The year after that, it will double again. We are creating tremendous amounts of information. I mean, think about when you go on holiday. Think about when you take your digital camera on, on vacation. And you know, a few years ago, before digital cameras, you were very judicious in the amount of pictures you took because you had to carry rolls of film around. Today, we think nothing of taking hundreds or thousands of pictures, many megabytes in size, sometimes HD video, and, and, and we think nothing of taking thousands of pictures, often with the good intentions of deleting the bad ones when we get home. We don't, we store them all. We, it turns out that we store 92% of all the information that we come across. And we're creating information in so many different sources. I mean, email. Over 200 billion email messages are sent every single day. We download more than 600 applications every second. We upload more than 60 hours of video to YouTube every single minute. Facebook, home to 140 billion photos. That's the largest repository of photos anywhere on the planet. And by 2015, the next three years, more than one million video minutes will traverse the network every single second. So we're creating a ton of new data, new information. We are also seeing all sorts of new devices with an insatiable demand to create and consume rich media. So we're starting to see things like flexible displays, roll-up displays. We're seeing things like video conferencing solutions. We're seeing glass windows that double as displays. So in the coming years, you'll look out your glass window, and instead of it being a, simply a glass window, it'll be a display. You'll see a, a, maybe a beach scene or a jungle scene, what have you. Um, flexible displays, roll-up displays, and so on. Interactive mirrors 
mirrors, whereas you look into your bathroom mirror, your mirror is looking back at you and gathering vital signs about you, your blood pressure, your heart rate, your skin temperature, pupil dilation, things like that. So we are creating rich media in, in record rates, and devices themselves are, are uh, maturing where they are creating and consuming rich media at unprecedented rates. We are moving from megapixel to gigapixel to terapixel images. Uh, you know, a few years ago, a medical scan, for example, would have been a few megabytes in size. Today, a medical scan, like an MRI scan or a CAT scan, is many terabytes in size. Why? Because higher density, three-dimensional images, volumetric imagery. So the data itself is getting fatter. Now. One of the benefits of all of this is we're moving more and more of this data into the cloud. So, you know, cloud technology is, um, is changing how we architect solutions. And when we think about cloud, you know, we often think about, you know, cloud is a great way to take my infrastructure and put it on someone else's premise so they manage it. They manage my apps and my services and, and my infrastructure. And that's a great benefit for cloud, but there are other benefits for cloud that we don't often talk about. Cloud technology is creating new capabilities where all you simply need is a mobile device with a connection. You now hold in your hand a supercomputer. This is not a phone anymore. This is a connection to a supercomputer. And I'll give you a few examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. So the first is cloud technology is enabling us to communicate in any language. We're seeing advances in language translation. You know, Microsoft, for example, demonstrated um, just a few days ago a technology where you could do real-time translation, and they demonstrated English to Mandarin, and not only was it real-time, but it also retained the accent of the original speaker. So when you heard it in Mandarin, you, you weren't simply hearing a robotic translation, it sounded like the person was speaking Mandarin because it kept the nuances of the voice. We're seeing things from companies like AT&T, Vocera, and others taking technology, putting, putting it into the cloud, and then all you need is a connection to do things like language translation. We're seeing services like Wolfram Alpha uh, moving into the cloud. If you haven't used Wolfram Alpha, it's a computational knowledge engine or computational search engine. You know, today when we do search, we do a search and we get results back. What if you could ask the cloud a question? Um, you know, for example, when is the best time of year to plant my crops based on my uh, geographic location? Uh, or what color should I paint my house? Or what's the best deal I should get for this car that I wanna buy? That's where we're moving to where the cloud is becoming a computational knowledge engine where you can start asking questions and get intelligent responses back. IBM is doing a lot of work in this space with a, a technology called IBM Watson. Uh, Watson is a supercomputer. Some of you may recall when IBM's Watson beat uh, a human, Ken Jennings, at a game show called Jeopardy. And IBM's Watson has a unique capability in that it understands language like we do. It understands linguistics like humans do, and it can parse it. And when you ask Watson a question, you don't get 100,000 results back. You get one result back, and it's always the right result. Watson is now moving into other fields like healthcare and legal. So in the coming years, you may get on a phone call or on the web and ask what you think is a physician questions, and it may very well not be a physician. It may be technology like IBM's Watson acting as a first level support for some of these medical type questions. So the message is that these devices that we hold in our hands now are no longer phones. These are connections to supercomputers, or if you will, a supercomputer in your hand, because all you simply need is a connection to harness all this capability. And the reverse is true. Those without a connection will be severely impacted. They won't have access to some of these services going forward. Now, when I give some of these presentations and I talk about the massive amounts of data and I talk about all these things being connected, I often get the question, well, what about the network itself? Will the network be able to handle this demand? You know, you're talking about massive amounts of video. Will the network collapse under its own weight? Well. The, the short answer is no. The network is 
the network backbone and the speeds and connections are growing at exponential rates to accommodate this demand. And I sometimes use my own home example to illustrate this. I got online sometime in 1990, and I've, I've tracked my connection to my home over the last few decades. When I first got online, I had a 300 bit per second connection. Not kilobit or megabit, but 300 bit. It was a very poor connection. Today I have a 50 megabit connection, which is 170,000 times faster than what I had two decades ago, and yet I pay a fraction of what I paid before. And instead of a single connection that I had two decades ago, I now have 45 devices in my home that require an always-on connection. So whether it's my thermostats that can go on the internet and check the weather and adjust themselves based on weather conditions, or a DVR that goes out to get content, or televisions or gaming consoles that can download content. The point being is the network speeds of my home have increased hundreds of thousands of times. My cost is a fraction of what it used to be, and the experience I and my family get is radically different than what it was just a few years ago. Uh, I'm gonna skip through a couple just in the interest of time. So let's talk about the implications of some of these trends. Yeah, I'll make an argument that human beings, that we advance for really one reason only. And it's not about our technology and it's not about our tools. We advance because of our ability to communicate with one another. So 8,000 years ago, when mankind discovered fire, their ability to take that knowledge and communicate it to the next tribe prevented the next tribe from having to discover. When Watson and Crick discovered the DNA double helix, they took that knowledge and passed it along so other geneticists could learn and build on top of it. There's a saying that we stand on the shoulders of giants. 200 years ago, if I wanted to communicate with you or anyone else on the planet, I would have, it would have taken weeks or months if I could even do so. The experience would have been very poor, very slow. Today, we can communicate with millions or billions of people anywhere in the world in seconds. We can share, we can educate, we can learn from one another, and we can do it instantly in rich, immersive ways, like video conferencing, for example. It means that if you believe my premise that we advance because we communicate, we have now significantly improved our ability to communicate because of networking technology, because of the richness in which we can now communicate. Humans are gonna start advancing at exponential rates. I'll give you a couple quick examples to illustrate some of the early sort of signals. Some of you may recall the earthquake in Japan um, a year or so back, and then the subsequent tsunami. And what was interesting about that event, I mean, tragic event, but what was interesting about it is people were online tweeting, warning family and friends, and bringing awareness to the plight uh, minutes before the government even acknowledged that this event had occurred. So the word of mouth from people, from citizens, from individuals through social networking is now the fastest form of communication. And if you sort of follow this trend out and you look at some of the trends that we're seeing, and we're seeing broadband wireless to phones that are in the tens of megabits, hundreds of megabits. I mean, this phone has a 55 megabit connection. That's faster than the connection to my home, right? So as we see broadband speeds coming to handset devices, as we see movie production studios on these types of devices that rival production studios just a few years ago, as we see every television get connected to the internet and um, have cameras in it, we will see in the next 10 years, everyone becomes a reporter. Anyone will be able to broadcast into anyone else's home with their permission in real time. So if there's an event in the world, no longer will you have to go through an intermediary. You can connect directly to the person on the ground and see through their eyes directly into your home. So everyone becomes a reporter. Why do we care? This is gonna bring unprecedented transparency to how we see our world. Transparency into governments, transparency into citizens, and empathy for one another around the world. Now, let's talk about how technology is adapting to us. You know, one of the things that we've, 
had to deal with throughout all of our technological history is that we have had to adapt to technology. We've had to adapt to the machine. And one of the examples I often use that's just a, a comical example is the VCR. Uh, the video cassette recorder. Many of you re may remember, or may even still have, a VCR with a 12 o'clock blinks on the front of the VCR, and you don't change it. And the reason you don't change it is because we have to figure out how to change the time, and it's too complicated, so we give up. We live with it. And that's sort of a, an illustration of how we've had to adapt to technology. We've, we've had to learn new interfaces, we've had to learn how to use new devices, but for the first time ever, we're now seeing a shift where technology is nowhere but everywhere, where technology is now adapting to us on our own terms. And I'll walk you through just a few examples. So the first is machine vision. Machines are learning to see. And I don't mean see as in a barcode or a QR code. I mean learning to see like we see, learning to discern people, faces, shapes, objects, um, just the same way that, that we do. Machines are learning to understand voice. I gave you the Microsoft example earlier. Voice recognition and voice synthesis technology is getting very, very good. In the next decade or so, it will be imperceptible from human speech, and it will understand any language, any dialect in just about any context. So human or speech recognition is getting very good. We're seeing a lot of advances in technology like augmented reality. The ability to overlay digital data on top of your visual world or your, your physical world. So imagine if you had glasses that uh, as you look around your world, the glasses were connected to the internet and the glasses showed on, on front of the display what you were looking at. So maybe I'm looking at this audience, and above your head I see uh, a floating balloon that gives me your name, your job title, things like that. Or perhaps I'm in a store purchasing a product. As I'm looking at the product on the shelf or I take it off, I see floating above it information about that product. Where was it manufactured? Is there competitive price information next door? Can I get it cheaper online? Are there allergies that I need to be considered, I need to consider? So we're seeing augmented reality become quite personal personal, and in fact, we're seeing uh, researchers work on augmented reality contact lenses. So while early on, in the next decade or two, you may very well get up in the morning and pop in contact lenses that give you augmented reality throughout the day. So as you look around your world, you see information projected back onto your retina about what you're looking at. We have already seen proof of principles done with augmented reality contact lenses. Um, the researchers are also working on something called a biofuel cell, and a biofuel cell is a device that gets implanted inside your body and is used to uh, generate electricity from the blood and, and glucose, or the glucose and oxygen in your blood to power some of these devices. There have been a number of stories over the last couple of weeks where using your body's own heartbeat to power a pacemaker, using the beating of your eardrum to power a cochlear implant, our body in many ways is becoming our own battery to power some of these devices. So this may seem sort of far-fetched, but we're seeing early signals of this today. We're also seeing uh, gesture-based computing become quite mainstream. So in the coming years, you may gesture through your channel on your TV. Uh, we're seeing digital signage solutions where the digital signage uh, solutions have cameras in them. And as you're looking at a, an ad at the, at the shopping mall, perhaps, that camera recognizes you with your permission. We see digital science solutions today that can recognize your age within a few years, that can recognize your sex, are you male or are you female, they can recognize what you're wearing, and then start serving up information that's specific to you. And consider the following, what if in the next few years, your television at home has a camera on it, and it will because you'll use it for video conferencing and other things, and your television is connected to the internet. Well, that television, while you watch it, with your permission, will watch you. So we're moving past an, uh, the time where you simply watch television to where television watches you, and as it watches you, it may recognize your emotion. It may recognize what you're wearing, uh, and it may serve up content that's specific to you. Imagine you, know, you have young children sitting next to you on your couch, and when the TV program is being played, 
your television recognizes that you have young children next to you and adjusts the programming appropriately so it doesn't show inappropriate content for the people in, in your audience. So we're seeing this type of technology emerge so that more and more intelligence in the devices that continue to observe us. And perhaps from the ultimate integration perspective, we're seeing a lot of advances in brain-machine interfaces. There was a story just last week where a gentleman called Zach climbed 103 stairs at the Willis Tower in Chicago. And the Willis Tower, also known as the Sears Tower, is the tallest building in Chicago. And he climbed up 103 stairs using a bionic leg that was controlled by thought alone. So he controlled that leg just like you would control your leg today, but it was a bionic, it was a, it was a, a prosthetic, if you will. So we're seeing a lot of advances in prosthetic devices and, and devices that are controlled by thought. Uh, you know, Toyota, for example, has a wheelchair that a paraplegic can control that wheelchair just by thinking about navigation. So from an ultimate integration perspective, you know, arguably that's the ultimate integration. It, what if you could control your world simply by thinking about it? What if you could change your channel on your television by thinking about changing the channel? Or you could turn your lights on in your home by thinking about turning the lights on. We're seeing a lot of advances in that space, and that technology is coming very, very quickly. Huge implications in the medical space, huge implications for people that are disabled, but also many, many implications in the general, uh, sort of general space. So the point to this chapter is that Technology for the first time is adapting to us. It's learning to see, it's learning to read our thoughts, it's learning to recognize emotion, speech, gestures. It's adapting to us so we don't have to adapt to it. Now, let me talk about one of the other, um, I think, sort of world-changing technologies we're starting to see and we'll see over the next um, few years. This is this notion of additive manufacturing or 3D printing. You know, today, we think nothing of going online and downloading a book or music or, or a photo or video, what have you. What happens tomorrow when you can go online and download a physical object and have that object printed perhaps while you sleep? Instead of going online and buying the physical object, what if you could go online and buy the recipe for it and then download the recipe and have it printed? And this is the notion of additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing prints objects layer by layer by layer until you're left with the object that you care about. And today we can print about 40 different types of materials. We can print plastics, we can print steel, we can print aluminum, precious metals like gold, silver, um, ABS, uh, polycarbs, all sorts of things. And in the coming years, we will also print semiconductors. There's work being done today to, to use technologies like graphene. Graphene is uh, single atom carbon, and graphene uh, turns out to be a great conductor for electricity, a great semiconductor material, And which means that in the coming decades, you may go online and download a recipe for the iPhone 9 and print the iPhone 9 at home instead of going to the store and purchasing it. Uh, a year or so ago, I showed on stage in Las Vegas a turboprop engine, and it was a 10 foot by 10 foot by 10 foot uh, prototype engine. And what was significant about that engine is the entire thing was printed. And what's interesting about that is that had they machined that engine using traditional manufacturing techniques, it would have cost $900,000 to machine. But because of 3D printing, <coughs> it cost them $25,000. That is a 97% cost savings. It, instead of nine months to machine, it took them one and a half months to machine or to print. That's an 83% time savings. So think about that for a second. Think about the cycles of innovation. If you can now design a product and you can fabricate it, for pennies on the dollar, uh, you know, 97% savings in, in, in cost and 80% savings in time, how many cycles of innovation can you do? How, how far ahead of your competition could you be because now you can test new designs at a rapid rate? 
We're seeing interesting advances in printing very large structures. Uh, in 2010, the entire shell of a car was printed. It was called the Irby. And this car gets 200 miles to the gallon. In the coming years, you may go online, design your car, and have it printed while you wait. You know, Airbus, they print, uh, or they, they manufacture large planes, of course. Um, Airbus has predicted that by 2050, they will print entire planes, the fuselage, the seating, the electronics, the engines, everything. They will print them layer by layer using hanger-sized 3D printers. So in the coming years, odds are a lot of the products you buy will be printed because we can start to print things and fabricate things and machine and manufacture things that are simply impossible using traditional manufacturing techniques. Work is being done even on food printers. And um, in the coming years, you may go online and download a recipe for dinner and have that dinner printed while you socialize with family and friends. Huge implications for allergies, diabetics, people that are trying to lose weight, and so on. Uh, so early work is being done in printing food. And we're seeing printers now from the very small to the very big. So for example, there are printers now that can print at the nanometer uh, level. Uh, there are tiny structures that are 50 nanometers across with moving parts that are printed. Uh, huge implications for healthcare and so on. And then we're seeing companies like D-Shape that are printing very large structures. We're seeing trials now where they are literally printing entire homes, including the walls, the plumbing, the electrical systems. These are printers that we will send to the moon and to Mars to print structures prior to humans' arrival. And the benefit of printing homes and structures versus traditional construction techniques is that it's significantly cheaper. It's about half the price and tolerances of about five to 10 millimeters, so higher tolerances by printing. And then you can also print shapes that are impossible to construct with traditional construction techniques. And then what about us? What about printing replacement parts for human beings? Well, Dr. Anthony Atala, who works at the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, is experimenting with this technology. And today in his lab, they have produced about 22 types of human tissue, things like muscles, livers, bladders, ears, and so on. And in the, he's now turned his attention to using printing techniques to print human organs. And last year, he demonstrated printing a kidney mold at the TED conference. Some of you may have seen that video as a proof of principle to demonstrate that we are on the verge of being able to print replacement human organs. It will be a few decades before printing human organs is routine because of trials and testing and so on that needs to be done. But the point is from a proof of principle perspective, we have shown that this is a very viable construct. So for those that don't want to wait decades for these things to emerge, there are sites today like Shapeways. You can go online, you can browse through tens of thousands of objects, and you can download these recipes, if you will, to your 3D printer at home or at work, and then you can print something. If you are a designer, you can design your own object. You can upload it to some of these sites, and people can then buy your design. What, from an innovation perspective, this is profound. This means that anyone with a great idea can now bring their designs to life. No longer do I have to build a billion dollar fabrication facility. I simply need to buy a printer for a few thousand dollars and then I can realize my ideas and perhaps sell them. And 3D printers are following the same price curve as 2D printers. So a million dollar 3D printer in 2006 will cost less than $1,000 by 2020. So less than $1,000 for a 3D printer. That means that we could see a 3D printer in every single home. What does that mean when every home has a 3D printer? And in addition to downloading music and books online, you can download physical goods. How does that change logistics? How does that change innovation? How does that change your market for people that can buy your goods and services? It's pretty profound. So we will download things as easily as we download music today. Now, as we 
um, create more and more of this technology as the population grows. You know, we're about seven billion people today, we're about a little over seven billion. By uh, 2050, we'll be at nine billion uh, population. A lot of people, but the challenge we've got is many of us are aging. There are not enough people coming out of, say, medical school, for example, to keep up with the growth. We're also creating massive amounts of data. I talked to you earlier about the Zeta flood and the zettabytes of information that have flown across the network and the zettabytes of information that we have to consume and, and understand. We do not have the current capacity to handle the world in which we're moving into. So we're gonna start creating new tools to help us. So one of the first new tools that we'll create are virtual people. We will create artificial people and we will create them in a digital way. If you have not seen a video on YouTube called Emily, there's a company called Image Metrics. You can go on YouTube and search for this, Emily Image Metrics. And if you look at that video, it's a video of a person called Emily. And you will look at that video and you will say, well, that's just a person. It's not, it's completely synthetic and artificial. And it will give you a, a, an idea of where we're going with some of this technology from an interface perspective. You take that technology and you couple it with the backend and technology we talked about like Wolfram Alpha and Watson and some of the supercomputing capability in the cloud, you put these technologies together and we start to create virtual people. And in the coming years, you'll go online, you'll pick up the phone, you'll have a conversation with what you think is a person. It won't be a person, it will be a virtual person helping you with legal issues and shopping and healthcare and so on. So one of the technologies we'll use to help us scale. The other technology we'll see more and more of in the coming years is robotic technology. And today there are about 19 million robots on the planet. The robotic population doubles about every 18 to 24 months, which means that by about 2030, there are more robots on the planet than there are people. And so we'll see robots in the workforce that we haven't seen before. So we used to see robotic devices in manufacturing and industry, but we are gonna start seeing robotic devices working alongside of us in the white collar workplace, helping us with research, helping us with um, managing the world that we're creating. So uh, robotic technology, we'll see a, a huge increase in that. And then the last chapter I wanna talk about briefly is perhaps the most provocative of all. You know, we, we have done tremendous things over the last few millennium as a species, but we're now entering a new period of human evolution, if you will. We're now entering an era of self-designed evolution. And you know, I believe that we have sort of crossed this threshold of simply discovery. We, are, we will continue to discover, but we are now starting to control our own destiny. We are starting to self-evolve, if you will. And if you look at just some of the early, early signals, there are many, many examples. So as of even last week, there was an article about being able to print stem cells, being able to print uh, retinas, artificial retinas from stem cells, so people who are born blind can now see. There are cochlear implants where people who are born deaf can now hear. I gave you the example of the bionic limb that was mind controlled so that someone could walk up stairs. So uh, we're seeing examples like that, exoskeletons. We're seeing 3D printing of organs, early stages, but over the course of the next few decades, being able to repair, replace, and augment most parts of the human body. So we're rapidly learning to self-evolve. And some scientists believe that we are entering a period where we will be able to figure out how to stop the aging process. Now, this is very controversial, and whether or not we will end aging is absolutely open for debate, but one thing is certain, humans are gonna start living a lot longer. You know, the, the average lifespan today for a human is somewhere in the 80 year old, 80 year range. But up until to the end of the last century, we, uh, the century before, the average lifespan for people was half of that. 
you know, during the Middle Ages, the average lifespan for people was 40. When we were Neanderthals, the average lifespan was 18. But because of advances in medicine and environment and food and so on, we are continuing to push the envelope in terms of human longevity. And as we understand genetics more and biotech and nanotech, we may see the aging process continue to extend. You know, any child born today will conservatively live to be 200 to 300 years old based on the path that we're on. So we can start to expect human beings to start living a lot longer. So let me just sort of end with this. I, I gave you, and I, and I apologize in advance, it's very difficult perhaps to follow some of these things without the visuals, but hopefully the message came across. You know, the network is playing a huge role in terms of how we communicate, how we share, how we download new goods and services in the future, how we provide transparency and empathy to one another in our world. It's a huge enabling technology, and yet it's only just begun. We're at that sort of 1% today. The other 99% is completely untapped. And um, so I've given you sort of just a quick um, sort of view of the, the role that the network plays. And it's not about, you know, simply what we make as a company, it's what we make possible. So let me end with that and thank you for your time. I don't know if we have time for questions. Uh, I think we do. So I'm, I'm more than happy to take a few questions if there are any. Uh, <coughs> David. Thank, thanks very much. I think we will take a couple of questions. Just one uh, quick question that I'll start with, uh, just to, at the 20,000 foot level. I mean, we talked about entrepreneurship earlier, uh, and I think some observers will say uh, that truly disruptive technologies depend on new firms coming to the marketplace and commercializing technologies, and that existing firms uh, will be invested in existing technology, and sometimes it makes it more difficult. Uh, a question, uh, first of all, what sort of assumptions are you making about the kind of permissiveness of the environment for entrepreneurs when you spin out these scenarios and what role do you see new ventures playing? And a correlated question, uh, you work in a big firm, how do you remain innovative if you buy the fact that those disruptive technologies are often done by newcomers? Uh, how does a firm like Cisco remain innovative? Yeah, great question. So, um, first of all, I think the face of innovation is going to change significantly. It's not going to be the next big firm necessarily that comes out with the next big innovation. It's going to be the guy with a great idea, with a network connection, with a 3D printer, with access to a social web that they can uh, promote an idea and refine the idea and then test it with the, the social crowd. Um, so the face of entrepreneurship is changing. The face of innovation is changing. Uh, how people get feedback on products. You know, you no longer have, you know, let's take Cisco. You know, we have, you know, say, 70,000 employees. Well, we really don't have 70,000 employees anymore. We have 7 billion employees. Because of network connectivity, we can get feedback on our technology, our direction, our products, our services through social networking, through social technology. So the face of entrepreneurship, the face of innovation, take Kickstarter as one example. Some of you may know Kickstarter. You know, Kickstarter, if I have a great idea, I can go online, I can submit my idea, and I can raise funds from the social community and one recent example uh, there's a company called Pebble, and these guys had a great idea for a watch, a watch that connected to the internet. It's called the Pebble Watch, and they went online to Kickstarter, and they wanted to raise a few hundred thousand dollars. They raised over $10 million, and think about if you went to a venture capitalist to do that, that's a very different model, uh, how we raise money, how we socialize, how we innovate, how we test. So I think the face of innovation, the face of entrepreneurial is changing. How does, how does a company like Cisco stay innovative? Well, we have folks like myself, and, and there are peop many people like me across the company. We have R&D facilities. We spend a significant amount of money on R&D, uh, you know, billions of dollars every year to, to stay current. Uh, we're very customer-facing. Um, we spend a lot of time with our customers, understanding what it is they need, the challenges that they've got, how we solve those challenges. We, um, 
we stay very close with our venture capitalist community. We stay very close with um, the startups in the valley, the startups in the world. So it's about having a lot of feelers out there and making sure that you stay connected with the innovation that's going on. It's also about making sure that you do rational experimentation inside your own company. So test new ideas, test new concepts. But the opportunities are out there. Uh, and so it behooves large companies to make sure that they stay innovative because it's there for the taking. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, Dave, over there. Uh, question is, okay, you said that, okay, uh, the amount of data we generate and keep uh, is growing exponentially. But obviously there's a, a big chunk of that data is rubbish and noise. Using your example, Correct. Uh, taking pictures, only a little amount of that is, is useful. So how you relate the amount of uh, useful data we generate to the kind of overall uh, data. And correlated question, okay, obviously, yes, uh, we also generate more and more uh, useful data, uh, and it's, it's becoming more and more complex. Uh, are we, uh, what are your perspectives on uh, whether we will be able to really boost uh, the human ability, the brain ability to grasp or comprehend and manipulate and reuse, uh, creatively use that data in the future? Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. So let me answer in reverse. Um, there's a lot of work going on right now to figure out how to reverse engineer the brain. For example, IBM has a project called Blue Brain, and it's a 10-year mission to figure out how to take a brain and reverse engineer it down to every synapse, neuron, chemical pathway, and so on. It's very early on, um, and we're far from being able to, um, to do that. But in the coming decades, um, I think it's quite achievable we will reverse engineer the brain. And if that does indeed happen, it means that you may have a additional brain, if you will, that you carry around with you. That brain may live on your device, it may live in the cloud, but it may offload a lot of the mundane tasks, if you will, that we do. Um, whether it's responding to an email, let's pretend we have email in the future, hopefully not, maybe we have something better. But whatever the task is, whether it's shopping, research, um, buying a new car, buying a mortgage, we may offload some of that to our proxy brain. So that, that's decades out. But um, a lot of work is being done in that space to figure out how to replicate what we've got. Whether or not we'll do it, we'll see, but I'm optimistic that we will. In terms of the noise, you're absolutely right. One of the big challenges we've got today is a lot of the data that we create is, let's be honest, it's unusable. Um, and it's unusable because it's rich, which is irony. So a lot of the data that we create, 90% of all the data we create is rich media, it's video, it's photos, for example. Well, you or I can sit down and look at a photo or look at a video and we can quite quickly understand what that video is about or what that photo is about. Um, we can watch a movie and a two hour movie and we can summarize that movie and say, ah, in about in a minute or two, we can say that movie was about the following and we can draw inferences and so on. Machines can't do that yet. And I say yet, they will. In the coming years, machines will learn to understand um, rich media like we can. There's a lot of work going on in research and academia today to figure out how to understand uh, rich media like we understand rich media, to infer context and so on. So we're not there yet. A lot of the data that we're creating is noise, to your point. Um, but over the coming years, we will be able to take that data and do richer things with it because we're offloading it to machines. So we're at a bit of an inflection point, I think, um, until we can do something meaningful with, with some of that data. Hello, thank you for the interesting speech. Uh, my question is, uh, you everything you told will appear in maybe five, 10 years, but what will appear in the next year? So what will be the key drivers uh, for the industry, uh, technology sector, IT sector, innovation sector, and uh, what will be the key challenges in 2013? Yep, okay. Great, great question. So, um, so the, the reason I did sort of a ten-year view is I wanted to give kind of a more futuristic view of where we're going. That's you know I wanted to have a position. But if we bring it a bit closer to home uh, in the next year, so we're seeing um, we're seeing advances in 
the internet of everything. We're seeing more and more devices get connected. We're seeing advances in broadband speeds. We're seeing innovation in um, material sciences, 3D printing, uh, which we touched on. Uh, so while some of these things that I talked about from a 10-year view won't be as mature as they will in 10 years by 2013, we'll start to see more of those. I mean, one of the big things we'll start to see next year are, which I think is gonna be, it was gonna drive a lot of innovation around product development, are new types of displays. So uh, coming next year, we'll see a lot of flexible displays, a lot of roll-up displays. That could change the face of the mobile phone market. It could change the face of tablets, um, how we treat different types of environments. So I think the new types of displays that are coming out, we're seeing um, advances in ultra-high def technologies. So 4K by 2K or 8K by 4K displays, ultra-high definition, uh, ultra-high resolution, uh, so video capabilities. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's going to be a lot of what we're seeing now, but sort of taken to the next level. So an increase in funding in cloud technologies, uh, an increase in uh, more and more devices being connected, uh, an increase in video, um, collaboration, mobility, some of those types of things. Dave, this is uh, Mike McFall again, the ambassador. Uh, normally, I teach at Stanford University. Uh, I'm just I'm here temporarily. And then I listen to what you say, um, and I've read some stuff that you've said before. Tell us a little bit about what the implications are for education, both at the primary, secondary level and at the university level. Because what I'm hearing you saying now, it's clear that the educational institutions I know are way behind dealing with the implications. So how do you think it'll look in 10 or 20 years? So or how I it have should look, too. Whether it Great. does look okay. that so way and how it should look. Got it, okay, so I have two boys that are getting ready to go into college. I, I can pretty much assume it's gonna take six years to get through college now. It used to take four. It's gonna take 50% longer on average. Why? Because they simply can't get the classes they need to get. The colleges are crowded. And if I'm being honest, you know, a lot of the educational system is broken. You, you know, you mentioned Stanford University. We live in Silicon Valley. You know, I have to help fund my children's school, as do all the parents that, that go to the school that my kids go to, because they don't get the level of funding that they used to get from from the, the government. Um, so arguably, a lot of the educational system is a bit broken. We're seeing some really interesting, innovative things come out of universities like Stanford, and MIT, and others, where they're putting more and more content online, not just content, but also classes, being able to do interactive classes online. And that's important because Billions of people today have no access to education, but they have a connection. So if I have a connection and universities put their classes online, I now have access to education. We should start thinking about some of the curriculums. In fact, I would argue every curriculum we do in university should be done synonymously, both physically and online. It shouldn't even be a second thought. Do we also offer this online after the fact? No. At the same time, it's physical in place and it's also online. So we can we can get that education to anyone that wants access to that education. So I would argue that some of the education systems are a bit broken. Um, we're seeing some really interesting innovations like the Khan Academy for example, where there are hundreds of thousands of hours of video online um, where we can learn about anything from you know, mathematics to calculus to history to geography, and it's just there for the taking. So as we put more and more online, as we do more interactive things online, we can scale it. So one of the challenges we've got now is scaling education. It's expensive. Prices continue to go up. Instead of four years, it takes six years. But we can use networking technology and video technology and collaboration technology to scale it so it's accessible to more. And if we start treating some of the online um, degree programs, if you will, equal to the uh, on-campus degree programs and sort of have them on par with one another, I think we bring education to a much broader base. So I think there's some innovation opportunities when it comes to education in terms of how we provide the classes, uh, and how we um, scale so, uh, the university system. Other questions? Uh, and I'm going to take advantage while I'm making my way. Um, uh, my colleague was asking, what about the protection of intellectual property in, in, in the world that you describe? I mean, uh, I can see some pretty serious emerging challenges. 
Yeah, so really interesting. I'll give you one really interesting example. Um, take 3D printing. I think 3D printing is going to significantly amplify the discussion around IP and DRM, digital rights management. There was a, an example um, about a month ago where someone was printing, 3D printing gun parts with a 3D printer. Now, in most parts of the world, you need a license to own a firearm. But if you have access to a 3D printer and you can print that same firearm, what does that do for DRM and other licensing issues? Um, so th interestingly enough, the company that manufactured that 3D printer actually went to that individual and said, we're taking the 3D printer back. You're not allowed to print firearms using our technology. So not only did, was it a DRM issue, they, they actually, or an IP issue, they actually physically went in and said, we need to remove this printer because you're using it for, um, for things you shouldn't be using it for. We're also seeing advances in other forms of printers. There's a, a printer emerging called a computer, chemical computer. And this is a computer printer, if you will, that can print drugs. And obviously that, that can be used for, for uh, huge benefits. If there's an epidemic, let's say, people at home could print a drug and um, take that drug and, and stop a, an epidemic or a pandemic. So huge benefits. And also getting drugs to places in the world that don't have access to, to medical devices. But what does it mean when you can print drugs at home? And, and most drugs are made from the same kind of uh, carbon compounds. Could you now start to print illicit drugs? Well, the answer, of course, is yes. If you have the recipe, you could. So I think you know, that's just one example, but you know, I think things like 3D printers are gonna really escalate this conversation around IP and DRM and you know, who has rights to do what. If I design something and I put it online and you download my design and you modify it slightly, who owns it? Do I own it or now do you own it because you've tweaked it, you've modified it a little bit? So I don't have an answer. What I do know though is that this is something of great discussion over the coming years and it does beg the question, are, are the existing IP and DRM models broken? Should we continue? Or is it better to say, Maybe knowledge is for the benefit of humanity, we should share it. And then it begs the question, well, what about IP for companies and how do they protect, protect the intellectual property and what's their incentive to innovate? So I don't know what the answer is, but I think there's gonna be tremendous debate over the coming years about how to tackle some of these things. That's a big, big challenge, I think. Uh, we hear that there's a ton of great innovation going on in the world, but when you talk to most scientists, or lots of scientists, they say the biggest risk facing the world right now is climate change. Uh, do you see anything in the pipeline to fix that? So that, that's one of the major risks. So let me be um, pragmatic for a second, because I, I am absolutely an eternal optimist. Um, I believe technology will solve many of the challenges that we've got. And um, history has shown that to be the case. We're at a bit of an inflection point, however. We've got some challenges around climate change, um, some challenges around food, water, um, uh, resource depletion, things like that. And in fact, in the US, there's this, um, there's a blimp um, that uh, used to fly around the valley. Uh, actually there's a news story last night, this blimp, as you know, blimps now are filled with helium. And this blimp is being grounded. And one of the primary reasons it's being grounded is because of the price of helium. Helium is a very precious resource. It's used in manufacturing and medical devices and so on. So we've got some constraints around resource depletion. We, we use a lot of these resources to print, or sorry, to manufacture um, a lot of our products, electronics and so on. So we have a number of challenges ahead of us. However, um, I'm absolutely convinced that, that technology can be brought to bear to solve some of these challenges. So whether it's carbon sequestering with some of these artificial trees that we're, we're able to now create for you know, climate change management. Um, if, if you want a deeper discussion on it, one of the things I'd recommend, there's a great book, a uh, gentleman called Peter Diamandis. Some of you may know Peter, uh, founder of the X Prize um, and co um, uh, co-founder of the Singularity Institute in Silicon Valley. Peter Diamandis has written a book uh, called Abundance. And the premise of the book is, 
we have more than enough technology to tackle the challenges that we've got. Uh, history has shown that often the problem is not bringing technology to bear, but it's ourselves. We often get in our own way. You know, so take stem cell research as one example. There's a little argument that stem cell research has sh been shown to tackle some of the challenges we've got with um, spinal cord regeneration and things like that. But it's fraught with um, challenges around religion and philosophy and you know, harvesting stem cells and so on and so forth. And so we often get in our own way because of the considerations we place around culture, religion, philosophy as we think about new types of technologies. I'm mean, gonna take robotics as an example. You know, robotic technology, there are concerns about it displacing jobs, for example. Will it or will it create new jobs? I prefer to think it will create new jobs, and I'm actually convinced of that. But there are concerns about that. We are seeing, um, in, in many ways, a new breed of Luddites, if you will. If you remember the Luddites that threw the wrenches in the works in the Industrial Revolution because it was taking away their jobs. Well, I think technology ultimately will ha handle a lot of these challenges that we face, whether it's climate change or food and water depletion or resource depletion or what have you. So I'm, I'm very much an optimist that technology will be brought to bear to, to tackle some of the challenges that you're talking about. But I'd urge you to read Abundance. That will answer a lot of the questions in a lot more detail than we have time for here. Dave, do you have time for, uh, for one more question? Absolutely. Okay. One more? Okay. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I was actually wondering about the 3D printing. I'm not really very deep in this topic, but uh, you said this technology is accessible, this technology is going to be cheap, it helps reduce costs, and so on. But what about the consumables? Because me and my colleague were also thinking about it, whether the consumables would be accessible, what are the consumables, and whether each family would be able to have them at home. And the second question is, uh, what about the human geniosity and what about human uniqueness? What uh, could, let's say, uh, with the help of 3D printing, the geniosity could be replicated. The brain of the genius or the prodigy could be scanned and then replicated. And in the end, like, we could 3D print an army of genius or the, the army of prodigies. So whether this could happen or nevertheless, uh, human geniosity and human u uniqueness would stay like the thing that uh, could be really unique and could not be replicated. Thanks. Okay, so let me ask, answer the consumable question first. Um, the short answer is we don't know yet how the consumable space is going to play out, but what I would imagine will happen, it will be very analogous to a traditional printer today where you buy the printer and then you go to the store and you buy cartridges. You buy a cartridge for different types of raw materials. So it could be, um, if it's a food printer, it could be different types of carbohydrates. It could be corn uh, of some, or, or some other material. Um, if it's um, finished goods, you know, hard goods, it might be, you know, you get a cartridge with different polymers, you know, ABS, PVC, you know, whatever the different components are, um, and you and you literally print them and print the object as you need. Um, many products are made from the same thing. They're made from plastic and steel and glass and so on, uh, and perhaps eventually graphene for the semiconductors. So I think you'll buy the raw materials just like you would buy the raw materials today for, let's say, an inkjet printer. Instead of buying red, green, blue ink, you buy the different sort of materials that you need. Um, so I think we'll see a distribution uh, model for that to be able to, to distribute uh, the raw materials. Um, and significantly cheaper than distributing finished goods because we get a lot more economies of scale. You can often mine the raw materials at the, at the place that you need to, to fabricate them. Uh, so we'll see a reduction in some of the shipping challenges and, and um, which will also help, frankly, with some of the uh, carbon emissions and climate challenges that we've got. Uh, to answer the second question about, I, in a nutshell, you're saying, can we 3D print or replicate a person? Well probably not in my lifetime. We are very, very complex uh, organisms. Now, you know, we can print early, early stages, we can print organs, uh, artificial retinas, things like that. So one could certainly imagine that in the coming millennium that we could print humans. 
arguably it would be more efficient to grow a human, if you will, than to print. Now, we might print replacement parts, you know, people that have lost a limb perhaps, or need an organ replacement, absolutely. But you, you're raising, I, I think, more philosophical questions and scientific questions, and, and uh, which I won't get into here, but it's about the essence of who we are and whether or not we have a soul. And if I print a new person, I print your a replacement brain for you, is it you? Is it your soul? Is it, is it the essence of who you are? So I think there are many questions we will have to grapple with from a philosophical perspective before we figure out the scientific. From a scientific perspective, sure, in the next couple of hundred years, yeah, we may very well be able to print um, a human. That's it's a scientific possibility, um, a theoretical possibility. We can't do today, obviously, but uh, yeah, it's feasible. Uh, but I think the philosophical questions will be bigger than the scientific questions. Thanks. So with that, I want to thank the ambassador again. I want to thank you for your time. And I think the message to take away is not about the specific things that I talked about. I w what I want you to take away are maybe two things. One, the network is playing a huge role in how we communicate, how we share, how we educate going forward. And the second message is that the opportunity for innovation has never been greater. I mean, yes, we've got some challenges, but if you look at this from a big picture perspective, the tools are there, the technologies are there, the people are there to communicate with, to share with, to, to vet your ideas, to get funding, to collaborate. We've never had a better time than this in history to be innovative. So if you take those two messages away, and it's not about the facts and figures that I shared, those are the two I want to get across, then I think um, you know, time well spent. So. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much.